The following lesson is linked to learning outcome two, reading and viewing. It addresses the assessment standard that requires learners to explore and explain key features of texts and how they contribute to meaning. Learners should be able to recognize that verse and stanza forms, rhyme, rhythm and punctuation affect meaning. Hi there, I'm Charlotte. In our previous lesson, we looked at the structure of poetry. To add to our knowledge of structure, I want to examine a particular type of poem in this lesson called a sonnet. I have selected a Shakespearean sonnet for us to examine. Shakespeare wrote many sonnets. This one is sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaks hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance, or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Now I'm sure that you have noticed that this is a very formal type of poem. The structure is fixed and the language is quite complicated or formal register has been used. This is what makes sonnets so impressive and so difficult to write. Now let's look at its characteristics. The first thing I want you to notice is that the poem has 14 lines. All sonnets have this line limit, 14 lines, no more, no less. Then sonnets have to be written in one single stanza. That means in one paragraph. Also, the subject matter in sonnets are usually elevated or about the important things in life. This poem deals with love and the admiration of physical beauty. Now let's talk about rhyme. Can you remember the definition of rhyme from our previous lesson? Rhyming words are words that sound the same. In poetry, they are most often used at the ends of stanza lines. Now let's look at the rhyming words at the ends of the stanza lines in Shakespeare's poem. Day, temperate, may, date, shines, dimmed, declines, untrimmed, fade, owest, shade, grossed, see, and thee. If you examine these words, and in fact, the words at the ends of the stanza lines in all Shakespearean sonnets, you will realize that the rhyming pattern is repeated. Day rhymes with May, temperate with date, and shines with declines. Now there is a very specific way or convention of indicating rhyme within a poem. We use the letters of the alphabet to indicate which words rhyme with which. We would represent the sound of day with an A and then the sound of temperate with B as it is the next new sound. So the poem's rhyme ends up looking like this. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. E, F, E, F, G, G. This representation of rhyme within a poem is called rhyme scheme. Think about how difficult it would be to find rhyming words in this way in every poem you write, no matter what the subject matter is. Shakespeare wrote almost 200 sonnets. That is quite an achievement. But this rhyme scheme is not only used to keep up the convention, it also adds to meaning. Let's look at how the rhyme scheme reflects meaning in this poem. We will look at the first four lines first. 
shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. The first four lines of the poem addresses the poet's lover directly and asks whether he should compare her to a summer's day. Shakespeare then argues that summer days are sometimes too unpleasant. This arrangement of four connected lines in a Shakespearean sonnet is known as a quatrain. So the first quatrain sets up the problem. Is it complimentary to compare one's lover to a summer's day? Now let's look at the meaning of the second quatrain, where this problem is discussed further. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Here Shakespeare says that summer is often too hot. The sun, or the eye of heaven, is too bright. And there are overcast days in summer. Often is his gold complexion dimmed. And summer's beauty is temporary. It doesn't last. Every fair from fair sometime declines. So Shakespeare asked the question whether it is complimentary to compare one's lover to a summer's day in the first quatrain. In the second quatrain, he discusses this issue further and gives more examples of why maybe it's not a good idea. Now let's look at the third quatrain. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So Shakespeare concludes in this quatrain that he cannot compare his love to a summer's day because unlike summer, her beauty will not fade because he has immortalized her in this poem. These lines indicate this. But thy eternal summer shall not fade as well as when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So each quatrain then has a very specific argument and this is how the rhyme scheme adds to meaning. Let's look at the last two lines of the poem. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. You will see that the rhyme scheme here indicates that these two lines belong together. Here, the poet motivates his decision that he came to in Quatrain 3. When he writes, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, he is arguing that as long as there are people around to read this poem, this poem will continue to exist. The poem immortalizes the life and beauty of his beloved one. So in these two lines, the poet concludes his argument, of which we should be convinced by now. These last two rhyming lines in a Shakespearean sonnet are called a rhyming couplet. But be aware that any two rhyming lines are called a couplet, not only in a Shakespearean poem. Now let's look at something else that we have discussed in our previous lesson. Rhythm, a recognizable pattern of stresses in a stanza line of poetry. The accent forms a pattern. There is a fixed pattern of stresses or rhythm in Shakespearean sonnets. If you read the lines out loud, you will hear this pattern being repeated. Listen. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. You should have an idea now that Shakespearean sonnets are structured in a very specific way. They first set out a problem in the first quatrain. This is discussed in the second quatrain. In the third quatrain, the poet provides an alternative view and this is further emphasized in the rhyming couplet. In our first lesson, we also saw that poetry is a rich source of the following devices. Figurative language, imagery, 
and symbols. Did you spot any of these in the poem we looked at? I will point out some examples, but there are more if you look closely. Sometime too hot, the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. Here the sun is referred to as the eye of heaven. This is an example of a metaphor. Isn't this a good example of the use of imagery? The sun is also described as having a gold complexion. Again, this is a wonderfully descriptive image and an example of personification because the sun is given the human characteristic of having a complexion. Also, throughout this poem, the poet used the sun as a symbol of beauty. These features, figurative language, imagery and symbols help to bring poetry to life and to ensure that poetry is understood and appreciated for many generations. This is what separates poetry from prose. I hope that you have enjoyed this lesson on a more formal type of poem. Bye-bye.